For week three, we are going to be looking at Ashanti uh, and the Gold Coast. Ashanti was the most important political state uh, on the Gold Coast in the 18th and 19th century. And, of course, the Gold Coast today is the country that's known as Ghana. Ashanti came into being in about 1700 as a major state in the interior of the Gold Coast. Uh, it was a state that was that would subsequently, in the next couple of decades after 1700, conquer most of the territory of what is now modern Ghana. Ethnically, Ashanti by origin was an, was an Akan state. It, uh, that is, the ethnicity it was recognized as Akan. The language of the Akan is Chui, and Ashanti was one of the political states uh, there were about a dozen of them that uh, were a con, at least in their original manifestations. Ashanti eventually conquered uh, much of the territory to its north, which was not an Akan ethnic region, uh, and in fact included many other ethnic uh, groups, and so that the actual state at its height was a multicultural state uh, that had a significant Muslim population in the north. Uh, we're going to see uh, the, that Muslim population in the readings for this week in re reference to um, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, uh, who we'll be discussing uh, through chat, in, in chatting in particular, uh, but which uh, will, uh, there will be some introduction to in, in other formats, such as on the forum. So Ashanti and the Gold Coast uh, is the subject of today's talk. And as the Gold Coast, the name suggests, uh, it's an area in Africa where there was a considerable amount of gold, uh, which you see here on the opening page, uh, gold weights. These are weights uh, that are with beautiful little designs that are made out of gold. Uh, and um, and this was the way wealth was stored and the way wealth was measured in Ashanti and in neighboring states. So that Ashanti was a major producer of gold, um, which is where the name comes from. Here's a map of modern uh, Ghana showing uh, Ashanti in the middle there. Ashanti actually conquered everything in this uh, map except the upper west uh, part of the of the country. Uh, the area from Ashanti southward is all in the Khan region. This is what the area looks like. It's forested. It's, uh, and so therefore it's um, quite different from the savannah states to the north and other parts of West Africa. The other major commodity that was produced in, in Ashanti besides, um, besides gold was kola nuts, which you see here in the upper right hand corner. Uh, a kola is a, a nut that comes from a tree that grows in the forest in certain parts of West Africa, uh, is chewed uh, because it contains a lot of caffeine. Uh, it's actually cola is also the in, the inspiration for the various cola drinks that were developed at the end of the 19th century. Uh, but in in Africa, cola was usually just consumed by uh, chewing on it. And as you can see, this is a particular variety of cola. They're they're both whitish and pinkish in color. Uh, they easily split into to half along the seam that you see on the nut. And because each nut contains so much caffeine, they usually are shared. People share these nuts, so they often have a very social significance. Um, they have, to some extent, a religious significance, 
in that cola was uh, consumed extensively by Muslims, and Muslims were prohibited from drinking alcoholic uh, beverages or taking other types of stimulants, uh, but not cola, and indeed not coffee and 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 uh, and some other stim some things, but cola was one thing that was allowed. And what you see here on the, the left is the market town of Salaga, uh, which was um, a Muslim town in the northern part of Ashanti, which was the major market for the sale of cola uh, to the north. Most of the cola that Ashanti grew uh, was destined for the interior of West Africa, uh, not to Europe or overseas. And you see here again uh, a broader map that shows the links between Kumasi, the capital of Ashanti in the 18th century, the location of the three most important gold uh, fields uh, in West Africa, the Akan uh, gold fields, uh, the Bure and Bambuk. And Bure and Bambuk are on the Senegal River uh, Valley. Uh, the Akan gold is found throughout the forest regions and the many creeks and streams that are in Ashanti. Another map showing the selected towns in West Africa in the 19th century, again to give you a sense of where uh, Kumasi and Ashanti were located in terms of the other, um, other parts of West Africa. One of the features of West Africa in this time, which is not usually recognized, is the extent to which people actually lived in towns rather than in villages or in the countryside. And this only shows you a very small number of the towns, but nonetheless does give you some sense of how urban the region was. <coughs> this is a drawing of the capital city of Kumasi. Uh, the palace is on the right, the upper right-hand corner, and um, uh, one of the the relief from one of the columns is below the on the on the lower right. Uh, you see another gold weight on the lower left, and you see a drawing of the of the of this of the city of Kumasi above it. Now, symbolically, the Ashanti state. Um, was um, was built around the, uh, the idea that a golden stool pictured here on its side had had come down from heaven, and that is uh, claimed to be the origins of the state, and that this happened in about 1701. Um, and so th this regalia. Um, Rather than a throne, as in the kingdoms in Europe, uh, the kings here sat on these stools. Often they were wooden stools, but in the case of Ashanti, there was the golden stool. And here you see one of the kings, the Ashantahini, uh, sitting on the th on his uh, his um, throne, his golden stool, and surrounded by his court. Uh, many of whom have uh, uh, instruments and, and um, artifacts that are made out of gold. One of the features of the government of Ashanti was that no one ever was allowed to speak directly with the Ashantihini, the king. They had to speak through uh, an interpreter or a linguist or a spokesman who stood right next to the Ashantihini, and of course the Ashantihini could hear everything, but uh, you had to speak to the linguist, and then the linguist would then turn and repeat exactly what had just been said to the Ashantihini. This was the court uh, etiquette. Uh, this was the staff of office of the linguist, which of course is made of gold. You see other staffs of office uh, here uh, with other um, officials of the state, uh, each one of them having his own distinct uh, golden staff. In this, in this photo, what you see is uh, 
uh, a member of the elite who's wearing various uh, golden uh, items, uh, a, a, wrist, a wristband on his right uh, arm, which is made out of gold. You see on his left arm, you see various um, charms, actually, that have Quranic verses written inside them. He's holding a um, the tail of a horse, which is used to swat flies. And the most important is the kente cloth, and the cloth that is made locally, it's narrow strips of cloth I hear woven into a beautiful pattern. Other examples of, of, of kente cloth, and one distinct feature of kente cloth is that every cloth, piece of cloth is made with a particular design, and each design has its own name. Hence, uh, the one, one here, the actual name in, in Chui, when translated, means it has not happened before. I can't read the other one. <clears throat> Here's a contemporary map from the 18th century that shows Ashanti and the various um, other uh, states and polities around Ashanti, all of which um, to the west of Dahomey uh, were conquered by Ashanti. Another feature of the of the Gold Coast was on the coast itself were these quite substantial European built uh, forts made out of materials that were imported from Europe uh, because there was no local stone to which one could make from which uh, one could make buildings so all of that had to be imported from Europe. These are often called castles. This is Elmina Castle, the oldest one on the Gold Coast. Um, it's, uh, it's a castle for sure, but really what it is is a warehouse for goods, and it's the place where the, the European uh, merchants uh, lived uh, rather than in the town. Um, and... <clears throat> They were fortified, but their fortifications were not directed against Africans or African states. The fortifications were for protection against other European powers, uh, so that all of the different European powers built uh, these types of castles along the, along the coast. Uh, and they manned them and all of the guns were aimed out to sea, not into the interior. And indeed, uh, these castles uh, were built by the Europeans, but they always had to pay rent to the local state, in this case, Ashanti. This is the town around Elmina, the castle in the background. <clears throat> and you see the importance of the boats that are uh, that were used both for fishing and for t carrying slaves to the slave ships uh, and to bring commodities from the ships to shore. Along the Gold Coast there are no natural harbors and so hence ships had to sit out at sea and then these boats had to go back and forth uh, to the ships. They, in English, uh, these are often referred to these boats as canoes although you can see that they're actually very substantial and some of them can hold as many as 40, 50 people. Here's a, here's a drawing from 1682 that shows the, the, the canoes, the, the river boats that are going out to the ships that are uh, anchored offshore. Each one of these little uh, river boats um, had a uh, belong to a, a local asafo or a local organization of, of adult males who were the crew members and the merchants who operated each one of the little ships. And each ship had its own distinct flag. This one uh, was called Mother of the Town. And just like the, the, all the cloth has its own name, each flag had its own name. And then these uh, 
these organizations of men who operated the canoes, who operated these boats, uh, held, had shrines that were related to their specific asafo, uh, which was related to um, membership uh, in the, the group of men that operated the specific boats. And you see here more asafo flags. Here's a picture of Cape Coast Castle, which was another one of the castles, uh, a drawing from 1704 and how it looks today. Here's another one of the forts. This was Coromancy, um, which for a long period of time was one of the most significant ones in terms of the British slave trade. Uh, the, this uh, this fort, Coromancy, and the town around it uh, gave the name Coromanti, which is often the name that was used to refer to people from the Gold Coast uh, in the Americas. They were not called a Khan, they were called Coromanti. And yet another fort, an Amabu which also was a very important one in terms of the British trade in particular. And here is a representation uh, and shows exactly how many forts there were and where they were located uh, along the, the coast of um, Ghana. As you can see here, uh, in many cases, uh, forts were within sight of each other along the coast. I want to draw your attention to uh, certain features of this uh, table, which you can study later yourself in greater detail. First of all, you can see that 84% of all the Africans who left from the Gold Coast, that is the Akan region in the interior, uh, left in the 18th century. So that for this part of the coast, the slave trade is almost entirely an 18th century phenomenon. <clears throat> Second, 64 percent, that is almost two-thirds of everybody who left from this area went to British territories. So that, that means heavily to Jamaica, Barbados, uh, North America. And these statistics can be broken down uh, even further, much further. I've done it here by 25-year periods so that you can see, if you look at the far right column, the totals, that it's really in 1700 that the, the tremendous numbers of people actually left, the 17, 1700 to 1800, that century, where you have more than 200,000 people leaving a, a decade, which means 20,000 people a year, uh, just so that you get some scale, some idea of the scale of the migration uh, through the slave trade. Uh, before the 18th century, the major export from the Gold Coast was gold. And so it's only in the 18th century that the the numbers of the Khan in particular are significant in terms of of, of, of of those who went into the slave trade. And this was the period, 1700 to 1800, in which Ashanti emerged as the dominant state, defeated many other uh, Khan states, incorporated them, and in the process uh, resulted in a lot of enslavement of people. One of the individuals who came from there that we know a fair bit about is a man by the name of Venture Smith. And he was uh, uh, taken from one of the forts that I showed you, uh, uh, Coromanti, Coromanti in particular, and he left off the coast of Anamabu, uh, and he was taken initially to Rhode Island 
although he spent most of his life in neighboring Connecticut. Uh, his name was Venture Smith. Um, his uh, original name was Bukar, uh, his African name. He was named Venture by the, the person who bought him on the Gold Coast uh, in, in uh, 1739 because the money that was used to purchase his was all the money the guy could venture. And so it was his venture capitalism, and he named the boy Venture. And he, the name Smith comes from the man who actually allowed Venture to buy his own freedom, uh, which he was successful in doing. Uh, and he, at the end of his life, he never learned how to read or write, uh, but he dictated what he wanted on his tombstone, which is sacred to the memory of Venture Smith, an African, though the son of a king. He was kidnapped and sold as a slave, but by his industry he acquired money to purchase his freedom, who died in 1805. And finally, I show you here another gold weight and Kenty cloth to remind you of the artistic uh, and cultural sophistication of this region, uh, uh, which is why Ashanti to this day is recognized as an important part of the country of Ghana. Uh, 